not synced or whatever? I'm not finding them, but. All right. We'll just do yeah. something else. Sorry? Yeah. Who's doing music? You and Ram. Mm-hmm. Yeah, really good. There we go. Did you fix the chapel? No. No. I don't know what happened, but I had to change, but, well. Okay. All right. This is a three person thing. Okay. Have you already did all the go lives? It's ready. It go. It should go by itself. Oh. Yeah. But you did it on YouTube and Facebook. Well, good morning and welcome to chapel at CCBS. Uh, this morning we are uh, blessed to have one of our longtime professors, Wesley Scoggins, uh, up here to bring God's word to us this day. If you're joining us online, we welcome you and are so glad to have you uh, join us as we uh, engage in this chapel service this day. Uh, this morning, um, uh, Mr. Rand Dollinger is going to lead us in uh, our worship uh, through singing. We'll sing King of Kings and in Christ alone. And then after that, we'll have uh, Brother Wesley come up and lead us in uh, worship through God's word. So. Amen. When you say king of kings, the word of is always a subset. <clears throat> but when you say king of kings, there is no subset. <laughs> Darkness, we were waiting without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes, to fulfill the law and prophets, to a virgin came the word, from a throne of endless glory, to a cradle in the dirt. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, Praise forever to the King of Kings. Reveal the kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost. To redeem the whole creation, you did not despise the cross. For even in your suffering you saw to the other side. Knowing this was our salvation, Jesus for our sake you died. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit. Three in one, God of glory, majesty, 
praise forever to the King of Kings. In the morning that you rose, all of heaven held its breath, till that stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death. And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who come to the Father are restored. So Christ was born, and the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not faint. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three. Praise forever to the King of Kings. We're testing your memory on that last one. <laughs> of Kings. There we go. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Testing your memory on that last one there. <laughs> Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who does look on flesh, sorry about that, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness Scorned by the ones he came to save Till on that cross as Jesus died The wrath of God was satisfied For every sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day. Up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands, in victory since curse has lost its grip on me for I am his and he is mine bought with the precious blood of Christ no guilt in life no fear in death this is the power of Christ in me Life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. Amen. Amen. Thank you.
Good save. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Let me get my microphone turned on. All right. Um, well, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Wesley Scoggins. If we haven't had the pleasure to meet yet, I serve as one of the adjunct faculty here, uh, teaching mostly uh, church history and some Bible classes and some theology classes as well. Um, I'm actually filling in today for Dr. Corver, and we were uh, singing there, and I was thinking, uh, Dr. Corver has like a challenge, right? Yes. Like, what is it? You get a certain amount of steps. How many steps is it? Too many. Too many. Okay. More than he gets. More than he gets. Wow. Okay. Uh, and I was thinking, like, what if there was a Wesley Scoggins challenge? What would that be? <laughs> It'd probably be like, see how many epis how many movies of Star Wars that you can binge in one day. <laughs> How many cups of coffee you could drink in one day? That would be a good one, too. So if you get like a max of like 15, then you've gotten the Wesley Scoggins challenge. But take your Bible. I don't drink that much anymore. Maybe eight. Yeah. Uh, take your Bibles. Open up to Genesis chapter 40. Uh, this morning we're going to continue Dr. Corver's study over the life of Joseph. Um, and today we're going to be observing how a prisoner becomes the second in command over all of Egypt. Uh, you could say that this is Joseph's rags to riches story from the pit of prison to the palace of Pharaoh. And throughout the story, uh, we can be amazed at the circumstances that come about in Joseph's life and how he arises in rank. Indeed, we can even think, man, this Joseph kid has got a lot going on for him. He's good looking, he's smart, uh, he's a go-getter. Uh, we saw from the last time you guys studied that he's got some good morals too. Uh, he's sold from slavery to becoming the manager of Potiphar's house. And now from prisoner to prince of Egypt, what does this guy have that I don't have? But when we step back and consider the larger story that's at play here, uh, we see that while Joseph does have some noteworthy character traits, the story is about a god who is relentless in preserving his promise. That even when the text is not really implicit of God's involvement, we can see him at work. He's orchestrating all things for his ultimate plan. And the same is true for us today. Uh, we know that God is the good, covenant-keeping, sovereign Lord of history. Do you know that's why they call it history? It's because it's his story. That even when our circumstances tell us otherwise, we know that God is working all things to preserve his promise. And our job, right, as uh, children of God, as ministers of his gospel, is to be faithful to him in every situation. And this is evident in Joseph's life. And so we can see from Genesis 40 through 41, uh, if you haven't turned there, that's the text we're in, that God works in times of trouble. Right? That God works in his own timing, and that God works all things to preserve his promises. But before we dive into Genesis 40, uh, we need to take a step back and consider really the story so far. Uh, I'm, I think you guys have been going through the book of Genesis in chapel, but it's always good to, to see where we've been so that we can know uh, where we're going. And so keep these kind of in your back pocket as we go through the text today. Genesis 1 through 2, uh, God creates the world and he creates image bearers to represent his rule and his reign to the entire world. Uh, humanity is commissioned in Genesis 1, 26 through 28 uh, to fill the earth, to subdue it, to have dominion over all creation. Humanity was to expand the goodness of the garden to the entire world, to bless creation. Of course, by the time we get to the third page in our Bibles, uh, humanity fails to allow God reign over them by rejecting his commands. They seek to define good and evil in their own sight, uh, and because of their sin, God uh, brings curses, remember, to the serpent, uh, to the man, and to the woman. And amidst these curses, God gives a promise. Remember, the promise is that one day the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. That one day a descendant from humanity is going to rid the world of all evil, will put evil in its place. 
And then Genesis 4-12 through tells us of uh, the downward spiral of sin to the effect where God has to flood the whole earth to get rid of sin. But then after the flood and after the Tower of Babel in Genesis 12, God chooses this random guy named Abraham to jumpstart his plan of redemption. God promises Abraham that he'll give him a land, that he'll make him a great nation. And remember this, that through Abraham's family will come a blessing for the entire world. In Genesis 15, God solidifies this promise through a covenant. And in this covenant, God also tells Abram that his family will be sojourners and servants in a foreign land. Remember that for later as well. And so this promise continues from Abraham to his son Isaac, to his son Jacob. And now we're dealing with one of Jacob's sons, Joseph. And so in these chapters, uh, 41, 40 through 41, we're going to see that God is working to preserve his promise. So let's dive in and see how God is at work. Number one, we're going to see that God works in times of trouble to preserve his promise. In Genesis chapter 40, uh, verse 1, it says, Some time after this, some time after Joseph's imprisonment, right? And Joseph is falsely accused by Potiphar's wife, and he is put in prison. And Genesis 39 ends with Joseph in prison becoming the manager over the prison because, look at verse 23, because the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, he prospered. So while Joseph is in prison, right, Genesis 40 tells us that two of Pharaoh's officials just happened to come into Joseph's prison. That these two officers, uh, the cupbearer and the baker, these each have their own dreams uh, that they can't understand. Uh, Look at verse 7 of Genesis 40. Uh, Verse 6, too. Uh, Joseph came to them in the morning, and when he saw that they were troubled, and so he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with them in his custody in his master's house, why are your faces so downcast today? They're saddened. They're uh, distraught because they have these dreams that they can't understand. Uh, And when they tell Joseph of these confusing dreams, Joseph confidently asserts in verse 8, um, do not interpretations belong to God. Pray, tell them to me. So there's a couple of things that we can note here. First, this has to be an act of divine providence. If you know where this story is going, it's not just a matter of chance that the officers just happen to be under Joseph's care. Uh, It's not just a matter of chance that these officers Officers have dreams that nobody can interpret but Joseph. Uh, God is working through this troubling situation for his own purpose. Notice also Joseph's changed attitude towards dreams. In Genesis 37, Joseph is almost like this arrogant, boastful kid telling his family about these dreams that he's had. But now here in Genesis 40, Joseph recognized that dreams and their interpretations belong to who? belong to God alone. It belongs to God. This changed perspective of Joseph. Joseph then offers these uh, uh, these interpretations uh, to both the cupbearer and to the baker. Uh, And for the cupbearer, the dream is very favorable. Uh, He dreams of a vine with three different branches that blossoms into grapes. Uh, The cupbearer then presses these grapes uh, into a cup that is placed into Pharaoh's hand. And Joseph tells uh, the God-given interpretation in verse 12, if you'll look at at it with me. Uh, Then Joseph said to him, this is the interpretation. The three branches are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office. And you shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hand uh, as as formerly when you were cupbearer. And so Joseph gives him uh, this positive interpretation to it. Uh, But in verse 15, Joseph tells the cupbearer his story. See, Joseph's had, so far, this roller coaster of a life, from being the favorite son of Jacob to being in a pit sold into slavery. 
uh, from the manager of the prestigious Egyptian official to now being in prison for something that he hasn't even done. Joseph is pleading his case of innocence, and he just wants to get out of that pit. So far, he can't seem to escape from it. And hearing this favorable interpretation of the cupbearer's dream, now the baker wants to have his. Perhaps to show that there's no partiality in dream interpretations, Joseph tells the baker what his dream means. The baker dreams in verses 16 through 17 that three cake baskets were uh, on my head and the uppermost basket were all sorts of baked goods for Pharaoh, but the birds were coming down and eating the bread out of the basket on my head. Uh, The interpretation for the baker is not so favorable. The baker's head will be lifted from his body. Pharaoh will hang this man and the birds will eat from his flesh. Of course, these dreams do come into reality at the end of the chapter, showing the validity of Joseph's ability to receive these interpretations from the Lord. The baker is killed, but the cupbearer is restored. Again, it's evident that God is working through these troubling times to work in Joseph's life. It reminds me of the story of Ruth. You remember, Ruth just so happened to be picking grain from Boaz's field, uh, who himself just so happened to have the qualifications to redeem Ruth's family. Or even think of the book of Esther, the Israelite woman who the king right, just so happened uh, to choose to be queen. In each of these stories, these characters went through difficult situations. These characters went through troubling times. For Ruth, it was the threat of homelessness. And for Esther, it was the destruction of her people. Despite this, the Lord used their place and their situation to work all things for the good of those whom he loves. That sounds a lot like Romans 8.28, doesn't it? Perhaps today, you're in a troubling time in your own life or in the life of your ministry, you can have the confidence that God is at work even in times of suffering. Uh, Just to give you a brief testimony of how the Lord has worked that in my life, uh, the Lord called me into ministry during a troubling time in my life. My uh, junior and senior year of high school was stricken with the sickness of my father. Uh, He had a tumor on his colon that was cancerous. Uh, They removed it, and the cancer stayed and eventually spread to his liver, which eventually uh, took his life my senior year of high school. Um, My dad was a solid man. He was a God-fearing man, and he was a deacon at our church. And so I always tell people that whenever the church doors were open, guess where my family was? They were at the church. And when the church doors closed, we were still there stacking chairs, cleaning up, and all that kind of stuff. And so I grew up around the church and with a family that served the Lord, and um, I had placed my faith in Christ when I was a, a child, but this situation rocked me, right? And I knew that I was either going to be all in on this Jesus thing, or it didn't matter at all. That there wasn't really any in between. And uh, through this tragedy that happened in my life, the Lord showed me the goodness of His Word, the goodness of His promises in my life. I knew it was then that I really uh, trusted Jesus as my Lord. I trusted Him as my Savior years back, but I never really understood what it meant for Him to be my Lord. And it's through the reading of God's Word in this difficult time that the Lord called me into ministry, right? And I, I wouldn't be where I am today if the Lord hadn't used that difficult situation in my past uh, to shape me and to form me into the image of His Son. And so the Lord works through these troubling times to preserve His promise. We can see that in the life of Joseph. I'm sure everybody here could give a testimony of how the Lord has been faithful during troubling times. But second, we can also see from our text today that God works in his own timing to preserve his promise. Turn to chapter 41. So if you remember, Joseph tells the cupbearer, just remember me uh, whenever you're in Pharaoh's court. And the cupbearer forgets. Uh, Joseph interprets the dreams and the cupbearer is restored, but the cupbearer forgets all about this Hebrew guy named Joseph. 
and Joseph remains in prison for two whole years. Two whole years after the cupbearer is restored. Think about it. That's two years of waiting, two years of wondering if God is going to lift him up out of this pit. And after two years, God sends a dream to Pharaoh. And like the baker and the cupbearer, Pharaoh doesn't know what to make of this dream. And he's so troubled that he calls all the priests and all the magicians of Egypt into his court to try to tell him what this dream means. And of course, these Egyptian priests, they fail to make sense of the dream because interpretations come from who? Come from God, right? And after uh, after they fail, the memory of the cupbearer is jogged. The Hebrew, he's the one who rightly interpreted my dream and the dream of the late baker. He's the one who can help, right? And so Joseph, after two years of waiting, is pulled out of the pit of prison, gets new clothes, gets a shave, and is presented to the king of Egypt. And like the cupbearer and the baker, Joseph tells Pharaoh that these interpretations belong to God, something that the Egyptian magicians failed to understand. Joseph's, or Pharaoh's dreams, uh, communicate what God is about to do. Look at verse 25 in Genesis 41. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, these dreams are of one. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. Pharaoh dreams of seven plump, luscious cows Uh, coming out of uh, the river that is later swallowed up by seven frail cows. In the same way, seven plump uh, ears of grain are later eaten up by seven frail ears of grain. And so these seven plump cows and ears of grain represent seven years of plentiful harvest. And the seven frail cows and ears of grain represented seven years of famine. Look at verse 42. Excuse me, not 32. I had written that down that wrong. Uh, Joseph says that the doubling of Pharaoh's dreams means that these things are fixed by God and God will surely bring it about. Uh, These seven frail cows and ears of grain shows that the plenty of the harvest will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. And again, Joseph tells Pharaoh that since this is a double dream, this is a sure thing that God is going to bring about. And without skipping a beat, Joseph goes in to tell Pharaoh what he should do about it. Uh, That Pharaoh should appoint somebody to oversee the storage of food in the seven plentiful years so that when the famine comes uh, and resources are scarce, that they'll have something in the storehouse. So notice a couple things from this passage. God saw to it that Joseph was released from prison, but not in Joseph's timing. Joseph waited for two years for God to bring him out of the pit only to hear the silence of God. Could God have given Pharaoh this dream immediately, and could God have uh, caused the cupbearer to remember Joseph? Yeah, he could have, but that's not God's timing. God's timing is different than ours. Remember 2 Peter 3, 8 through 9. But don't forget this one thing, dear friends, that with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. And so while Joseph was experiencing silence, the Lord was working in his own time to preserve his promise. The cupbearer might have also forgotten Joseph, friends, but God had not forgotten him. God had orchestrated the events of Joseph's life. Think about it. Uh, From giving dreams and being able to interpret dreams to also having the skills of managing uh, Potiphar's house well and also uh, the affairs of the the prison guard. Uh, God used these situations to uh, equip Joseph with the skills that were necessary for making sure that whenever the famine came, that the harvest was managed well. God used every single situation to bring about this amazing work. And so there's a couple things that we can take away from this portion of the story. 
I think for us, it's first living faithfully to God and trusting his timing. If you're like me, then you know that there are some prayers or desires you might have given to the Lord only to receive back silence from the Lord. Maybe it's a sin that you're asking the Lord to free you from the temptation of. Or maybe it's a a family member who is lost and you desire for them to know the Lord. Maybe it's to see the Lord work in your ministry. Perhaps you're asking God to give you clarity on a certain decision. Whatever the case, sometimes God answers us in silence. Joseph experienced that silence. And he waited two years before he got out of that prison. Keep your place in Genesis 41 and turn with me to Matthew 26. Joseph in this prison received silence from God from two years. But friends, the Bible tells us of another character who experienced the silence of God. Matthew 26, starting in verse 36. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And they said, he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little further, he fell on his face prayed and said, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So you could not watch and wait with me for one hour. Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, for the second time, he went away and prayed. My father, if this cannot pass, uh, if if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. So, what was Jesus's response to the silence of God? Jesus wanted this cup to be taken from him, but the Lord did not. How did Jesus then respond? In faithful obedience. Jesus, in this amazingly mysterious, divine way, both knew the cross lay before him and did not want to endure it. But at the end of the day, Jesus aligned his will with the will of the Father. And that's what we're called to do if we don't have a clear direction from the Lord. When we're faced with the silence of God, we can be confident that God is silently working in his time to complete his purpose. We instead are called to a long obedience in the same direction as we wait. So we've seen that God works through times of trouble. And we've seen that God works uh, through his own timing. And now we're going to see as we end this study that God works all things to preserve his promise. And so after Joseph gives this game plan to Pharaoh, uh, the king of Egypt sees no better man for this job than Joseph. Funny how that works out. Pharaoh notices that this guy is different. Uh, Look at verses 37 through 40 of chapter 41, if you haven't turned back to Genesis already. This proposal pleased Pharaoh and all of his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find a man like this in whom is what? The Spirit of God. And then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has shown you all this, uh, is... Since God has shown you, shown you all this, there is uh, none so discerning and wise as you are. Uh, you shall be over my house, and you shall be all over my people, and, you, and they shall order themselves as to your command. Only in regards to the throne will I be greater than you. And so from the pit of prison to the palace of Pharaoh, Joseph once again has risen the ranks to become second in the command of all of Egypt. This, of course... Remember, chapter 39 is because the Lord was with Joseph and the Lord blessed all that he has done. The Lord is the one who made sure that Joseph succeeded. So Pharaoh sees that Joseph is like no other, that he has the Spirit of God with him. 
the Holy Spirit gave Joseph wisdom over all the Egyptian uh, uh, priests and all the Egyptian magicians to know the dream, but he also gave him wisdom in order to know what to do about the dream, um, to make preparations for the coming famine. This reminds me a lot of 1 Corinthians one twenty five. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weaknesses of God are stronger than men. Joseph's spirit-given wisdom in interpreting dreams and making plans shows that God is superior over the wisdom of our world. The wisdom of the Lord is better than the wisdom from the world. But in verses 42 through 45, in verses 50 through 20, they actually paint a less than ideal picture of Joseph. This is the uh, Egyptianizing of Joseph, as, if you will. Joseph turns from a Hebrew to a Egyptian. Listen to how one commentator puts it. Joseph is raised out of prison and put in charge of all of Egypt. But at what price? He receives the linen clothes of Pharaoh's court. He receives an Egyptian name, and he receives a wife from the priestly caste of Egypt. God makes Joseph fruitful, uh, and he gives him some sons, one of his name Ephraim, which means to be fruitful. Yet the cost of Joseph's success seems to be the renunciation of the ways of his father, as his son, other son's name suggests, Manasseh, making to forget. He cannot be both the son of Jacob and what amounts to be the adopted son of Pharaoh. One of these identities must give way to the other, and it seems in this story that the Egyptian side is supreme. So whether it's success going to the head or just a blatant embrace of the culture, Joseph's quick adoption into the Egyptian lifestyle should give us pause and consider how Jesus succeeds where Joseph fails. Unlike the incarnate Son of God, who came to be completely loyal to his divinity and completely loyal to the Lord in his humanity, Joseph is just an ordinary man. Nevertheless, Joseph's plan works. Food is stored up during the seven years of plenty, and food is now available for the seven years of famine. I noticed something important in verses 56 through 57. And so when the famine spread over all the land, Joseph opened up the storehouses and sold to the Egyptian, for the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. Moreover, all the earth came to Egypt to Joseph to buy grain, because the famine was severe over all the earth. Did you catch that? Who was coming to, e to Egypt to benefit from Joseph, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham? All the earth. Remember the promise? Through Abraham's family, all the earth will be blessed. Here Joseph seems to be immediately fulfilling this promise made to Abraham, that his children should be a blessing to the nation. God has been working all things to preserve the promise. Every up and down in Joseph's life has given, them, given him the experience and the wisdom to accomplish this task. God has been working behind the scenes in times of trouble, in his own timing, and in all things to preserve his promise. But friends, that's not even the big picture. While there is this immediate fulfillment of the Abrahamic blessing happening to all the earth, there is a future promise of blessing that God is using Joseph to preserve. This famine affected all people. But, verse, but chapters 42 through 50 focuses in on Jacob's family traveling to Egypt to receive food that has been stored by Joseph. One commentator puts it this way, Joseph is positioned to feed the whole world, but it is more important for the future of God's plan that Jacob's clan be fed bread so that it can survive and receive the commandments of God. Think about this. God has orchestrated every single event in Joseph's life to fulfill this promise. If it wasn't for his boastful dreams, his brothers wouldn't be jealous. If it wasn't for the jealousy of his brothers, he wouldn't have been sold into slavery in Egypt. And if he wasn't a slave in Egypt, then he wouldn't become a manager of Potiphar's house. And if it wasn't for the false accusation of Potiphar's wife, he wouldn't be able in the place to interpret the cupbearer's dream. 
And if he didn't interpret the cupbearer's dream, he wouldn't have interpreted Pharaoh's dream. And if he wouldn't have interpreted Pharaoh's dream, no one would know about the famine. Joseph wouldn't have made the storehouse, and Jacob's clan would not have survived. God's beautiful act of providence is an act in every event in Joseph's life to ensure that the promises made to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 will come into effect. And it's through this Abrahamic promises, friends, that we receive Christ, the one who is the blessing to the entire world. In Joseph's life, ultimately, the outsiders, the nations, uh, benefit from uh, a right relationship with Abraham's promise. In the same way, Paul discerned a weightier dimension of the promise when he commented that the outsiders become insiders when they put their faith in Abraham's descendant, Christ. Listen to Galatians chapter 3, verse 7 through 9. Know then that uh, it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scriptures, foreseeing that God would uh, justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So in the same way that the nations came to benefit from Abraham's descendant, friends, the nations come to Abraham's seed, Jesus the Messiah, to receive faith and to receive right relationship with God and to be adopted into God's family. God works all things to preserve his promise. We need to trust him even when times are tough. Uh, We need to trust him even when we receive silence from him. God is working all things, all things. Turn to your neighbor and say, all things. things. God is working all things things. for the good of those he loves. Father God, I thank you so much for this example that we see in Joseph's life. That Lord, while Joseph does have some character traits that we can latch on to, Joseph's not the main character of the story. You are. And through your son, Jesus Christ, you have given us the blessing of the entire world. And so, Lord, help us to look to Christ. Help us to be obedient to Christ in every situation. And, Lord, whenever uh, we uh, try to commune with you or we try to pray to you, Lord, and you uh, give us what seems to us to be silence, give us the trust knowing that you are silently working in all things for the good of those who love you, for our good, and Lord, ultimately for your glory. I thank you for Christ, and Lord, help us to be obedient to him in all things. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, friends. Amen. Uh, For the rest of us in the room, that's a great example of using surrounding context (laughs) to understand the Bible. Uh, So often what happens is we pick up a a story out of its context, Mm -hmm. and it makes sense, but it doesn't make the fullest sense, right? Because if you take Joseph's little story and say, oh, well, you need to be, you know, interpret your dreams and do whatever to Pharaoh or whatever, you you can make that make sense. And you say, well, there it is in the text, but you have to connect the dots, right? in what we call biblical theology and looking at the progression of the text and all. And so good word, brother. Uh, What a great reminder. And what a good example for all of you young preachers and teachers to make sure that you uh, use your context clues to interpret the text right. Uh, Next week, there will be no chapel. It is week eight. And we assume that you might have a midterm exam you'd rather be studying on. I know all of you would think, well, we need to come in here and pray. For our midterm exams, Uh, but uh, I'll tell you, uh, I used to give midterm exams and I would would pray a prayer like this. May the students who studied do well on their exam and the other students were offended. I said, well, if you didn't study, God can't give you something from nothing, you know. (laughs) And so, uh, what's that? Well, he did the universe, but he's not going to give me that if I don't work that, so... Anyway, uh, no, no, uh, no, no chapel next week for week eight. The following week, you'll be on what? Fall break. And so enjoy fall break. We will reconvene uh, when you get back, and it'll be a great thing. So anything else we need to add to the 
announcement that today. That said all you're going to say. I see that hand. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> So 8.30, and it's going to be where? Right in the front. Okay. We don't have a flagpole. So in the old days, we would do see you at the pole, but this year it is see you on the front lawn. There you go. Well, let's pray together, and we'll be dismissed. I encourage you to stay for a few minutes and say hello. And then faculty, don't forget, we have faculty meeting in a little while, about 30 minutes from now. So let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this great reminder from Scripture, Lord, that you are in charge of all things and that you work all things together for good. Not necessarily for my good, but ultimately for the world's good. You brought Jesus Christ into this world. Uh, his death on the cross was not good, but it did great good for us. And so, Lord, thank you for the reminder today. Thank you for the life of Joseph. Thank you for the example. And I thank you for Wesley. Thank you for the example of teaching he gave us today, not just from a sense of um, what the Word said, but how to handle the Word. And so thank you for that. Be with us as we go our separate ways and be with the students and help them to do well on their exams in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. 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 You're dismissed. God bless you.